All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, a webcast, um, an online show. Um, the uh, terminology is up for debate. Um, but whatever we are, you can call us whatever you want. We're here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that is fine. We um, record our shows every week as well. And so you can go back and watch our shows on our website that I'll show you at the end of the show um, and see all of our archives going back to the very beginning when we started in 2009. Um, both the live show and the recording recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends and colleagues and let them know what kind of shows we have going on here. Um, we do a mixture of things here, book reviews, mini training sessions, interviews, uh, standard presentations. Um, basically, our only criteria is something, it has to be library related. Other than that, you know, we're pretty open to anything. Um, we do sometimes have guest speakers come in, and sometimes we have Nebraska Library Commission staff do presentations. And that's what we're doing here this morning. Um, we have our From the Basement to the West Wing, the Talking Book and Braille Services New Space. Um, we had some major uh, changes yes. <laughs> uh, happen. Um, there's a lot of history behind why this had to happen that I'm sure we'll get into. Um, and our Talking Book and Braille Service made some big moves last year um, across the hall from where we are right now, um, but you know, very close. So I'm just going to hand over to you guys. You can introduce yourselves and tell us what happened and where you guys are now and how things are going with it. Thank you, Krista. Yeah, and good morning. We've been trying to um, keep the Nebraska libraries posted as changes develop in the Talking Book and Braille service. Um, you might remember that we, we've moved to the digital players. This is through Library of Congress about, what, six, seven years ago, and this is what, what the new player looks like, and it is compatible with this book. This is a mailer for a book on cartridge. Do you want to introduce you guys first? Yes, I will. That? Okay, cool. <laughs> Cartridge looks like this. And from that, the Library of Congress developed BARD, which is an online reference service or on, online download sites. People can download their own books and magazines. And just under 10% of Nebraska talking book borrowers use BARD in addition to a service through the mail from us. And from that, they added the two apps. Uh, both for BARD. One is the Android app and one is the iOS app. And so that is how the Library of Congress is keeping pace with technology. I want to tell you some changes in talking book and braille service. And before we go further, I want to introduce the panel this morning. First is Brad Murens, a longstanding volunteer. Um, he's one of our narrators. He was here of um, at least 12 years and was present when we moved the studios from analog to digital recording and was here when we moved from the lower level to the uh, f to the west wing on the first floor. So Brad is a valuable asset. We're glad that you're here. Glad to be here. And Gabe Kramer is here. He's studio manager and the, moving the studios. Uh, that is not moving them, but <laughs> obtaining sound booths suitable for the new space was a very important consideration. And um, and Gabe was a key player in that process. So I'm glad you're here. Thank you. And Scott is here. Scott Schultz is a coordinator of um, audio production and circulation. And he's a hero of the move. <laughs> he shouldered much of the heavy work that was ongoing for a good, hard, heavy year. And we survived it. And obviously, we'll be grateful to Scott. And I'm Dave Ortley, and I direct Talking Book and Braille Service. And Scott, why don't you talk about the slideshow to get things started? Yeah, uh, I put together a little slideshow to kind of go over um, a bit of the narrative of what it was like to transition from the basement to the new location that we're in. And um, I kind of tried to put this from a more general perspective that any librarians out there who may be considering a move um, just due to you know whatever conditions come up, needing to go to a larger building, um, needing to downsize, having damage in a building that requires a quick move. Um, hopefully some of these tips can help for you know any of those sorts of situations as well. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and jump into the PowerPoint here. Yeah, um, should be on. Okay, can I just use the arrows? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, okay, so the space that we just left was in the lower level of the atrium building here at the Library Commission. Uh, the commission has basically occupied um, 
a portion, I guess about half of the lower level of the atrium building and a large chunk of the first and second floors as well, all just immediately above one another. And we've occupied that for about 20 years. Um, we moved into this building in, was it 1994, Dave? It's 94, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, and so um, the studios and all the circulation stacks were sort of designed and organized about 20 years ago, so Dave still had some experience from the previous move that was very useful as well for uh, figuring out what to do in our, in our current situation. In the lower level space, we had most of the Talking Books collection, uh, the stacks are organized down there. We had a fairly large tape duplication area where we would make copies of all of the books on cassette because they were on cassette from the 70s up until about 2010. Um, the recording studios, there were two recording studios uh, constituting a total of four rooms down there, um, two narrator spaces and two producer spaces. There was a fairly large meeting room down there called the Crane Room, some of you may have visited. Uh, there was a computer training room called the Heron Room. Uh, there was a small break room uh, with enough space for a couple people to sit, um, refrigerator, sink, that sort of thing, and quite a few different little storage areas down there as well. So we were occupying quite a bit of space down there. And um, after years and years of just different problems, mostly related to being in a basement, I mean, anytime you're in... It's a nature of basements. Right. Um, you always have some water intrusion problems. Um, they became sort of difficult to fix. It is sort of an aging building that we're in, and those below-grade problems are the most difficult ones to tackle. So we were kind of keeping an eye out for potential alternative spaces to move those things to get away from those problems. And an alternative space became available on the first floor of our building, uh, I guess it was about three years ago. Um, there was a firm called Firespring that was in our building for yeah. quite a few years. Um, and they, their business has continued to expand and they moved out to the south edge of Lincoln at this point. And their space sat vacant for, well, for about a year before we started begging to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, at that point we uh, decided to sort of look into it and see what could be done. Um, so some considerations that we had um, in looking at this new space, um, first of all, was the space going to be large enough for both the circulation stacks and all of the different types of rooms that we would need to put in there? Um, another question is if you're putting yourself in a good location for building recording studios, uh, the, the booths themselves typically need to be placed in some kind of location that's fairly protected from outside noise. Um, obviously, you build rooms that are as soundproof as possible in and of themselves, but that said, if you're building a soundproof room and putting it next to a highway, you're still going to have some problems, potentially. There's just so much outside sound. Um, buildings themselves have a lot of sounds that you have to think about for that. Uh, for example, furnaces in the wintertime, oftentimes when they start up, if it's you know, an old building and has sort of a, a rickety system that has really loud um, sound transmission going through the pipes when the furnace starts up in the morning, those kinds of sounds can end up in your recordings. So there, there are a lot of little things to think about. Um, so not only do you need to look at where you're located within the building, but you almost need to kind of hang out in a potential space for a while and just stand there and listen, basically, to make sure that, you know, unexpected sounds don't come through that space every once in a while. Because um, you could have the, the misfortune of uh, visiting the space um, during a quiet moment, and then when you walk out the door, some crazy loud thing happens <laughs> that's actually quite cyclical, and you just didn't happen to be there for that, that chunk of the cycle. Um, we're so, right on a bus route. Right. And so all, most of the city buses go right past mm -hmm. our front door. Right. Yeah. This is one reason that you often do see recording studios built into basements, because it does give you quite a bit of protection from sounds coming from outside of the building in. Um, you know, smaller windows or no windows at all. Um, also, you'll sometimes see studios built at the, the upper portions of a large building, upper floors or the top floor, because they're, again, they're sort of protected from traffic sounds. Um, in our case, um, the upper floors of the building, of course, are still occupied, and the first floor um, has worked out quite well. Um, at the moment, we're sort of protected um, from the rest of the sounds in the space. We're kind of protected architecturally, which we'll see in a moment. Um, and from the outside of the building, we're quite a ways away from the windows, mm -hmm. and there's a, another sort of vacant office space now between the front of the building and where we're located, um, with a hallway in the center. So that should protect us, even if that area should become occupied in the future. Um, another consideration uh, are what improvements can be made to improve the quality and efficiency of, of the work that you're already doing. If you're looking at a new space, it may be time to sort of think about things ergonomically. Um, are there any things missing, or how could you locate things um, to create a more efficient workflow? Uh, an obvious component of that for our move was being on the first floor 
puts us very close to where the mail comes in. Um, in the past, um, all of our mail comes into the back of the building on the first floor and had to be transported to the basement on a freight elevator, um, which takes a while, and occasionally if the freight elevator isn't working, it gives you some problems with how you're going to get things uh, to the lower level. Um, so it's nice to all be on one level now, and it's actually not very far from where the mail is because we're oriented closer to the alley of the building than the front of the building at this point for where the mail comes out, so it's actually not terribly far away. Um, and then one more thing is to start thinking about long-range long considerations for your facility. Um, if you're planning on continuing to expand your collection at a relatively predictable rate, you can start thinking in terms of linear feet of shelving. Um, if you're going to have the space for that, how you're going to accommodate it, um, what sorts of um, weeding plans that you might need to put in place to, to balance out acquisitions. Um, in our case, uh, the National Library Service provides the majority of the books that we circulate on a fairly predictable number per year. Um, although that number has increased in the last year. Um, so you can kind of do some estimates on what space you need and then how you're going to compress shelving or shift things around over time um, to sort of plan for how that's going to go. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into, um, this is a little bit of what our lower level space looked like. Um, I've got some better PDFs coming up for some of the newer stuff, but I, unfortunately I didn't have a PDF of the old space because it's old. Right, so um, in this illustration, um, the, the long little segmented pieces that you see are the shelving units that were in the lower level space. Um, the highlighted ones um, have moved upstairs with us, and the ones that are not highlighted are still, well, they were in the basement up until about a week ago, and they were oh, really? actually just removed. Oh, I didn't know there's, so, there's still stuff down there. We're going to see a yeah. totally vacant photo here at the end <laughs> oh, of this thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's taken a while to get everything moved out, but yeah, finally mm -hmm. that sort of thing is done. So um, you didn't but, need those extra shelves then when you guys moved over there, or uh, well, you are know, we still keeping them? Need is a <laughs> relative concern. Um, mm -hmm. We tried to retain as much as we could fit, basically. Mm -hmm. um, we did have some issues. Um, with how much will fit in the new space because mm -hmm. it is considerably smaller. I think one of the yeah. slides coming up kind of has the exact numbers, but and, and the, the cassette collection went 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 away. Right. And we did actually we, we, um, we expedited that with permission, and so that was very helpful. Right. Yeah, we're in an interesting transitional period in terms yeah. of media formats that we use. Right. Um, in switching to the digital, um, well, there are two aspects of it. One is the the physical cartridges themselves. The digital cartridges take up a little bit less space on shelves. Um, so we're able to theoretically get more per shelf if it came down to it. Um, there are a variety of strategies we could use to shelf things sideways if it came to that. Um, so in the future, we can look at how we could reorganize things on the shelves if we run out of room. Um, with the cassette collection disappearing, that gave us a lot more room to work with as well. Uh, and then some of that long-term planning that we were, I was talking about a moment ago kind of comes into play here too, where I anticipate that over time, we're probably going to see more people using BARD, uh, using the download site and mobile devices to access our collection, and probably less people using the physical books. Um, so there's a certain calculated risk there, but you know, if you're looking 20 years out or something like that, one could start to assume that we would have less reliance on circulating physical objects and more uh, circulation happening through the internet, um, or potentially, I mean, who knows, I mean, with this machine, um, there's been speculation that maybe someday there'll be ways to push and pull books to a physical machine, um, mm -hmm. kind of akin to the way that a Kindle works. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say, but, you know, there are all sorts of technology ex expectations that, you know, we could anticipate some of those things influencing how much physical space we need. Um, other areas of this, uh, the circulation area for where our incoming mail came in is toward the top of the illustration, some sort of shelving there and the duplication area was up there kind of just to the right of that um, mm -hmm. yellow highlighted space yeah, there. Oh, yeah. Stuff, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, 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 Gabe, if you want to do that. So they can see all that, yeah. Yeah, yeah so our circulation area uh, is where Gabe is there, and then just to the right of that is tape duplication. It was an alcove. Yeah. Right. Um, a consideration that I had here is that we're, um, as we've transitioned to digital recording, um, we can do a lot more post-production with things, and something that I've thought about for the last mm -hmm. decade that I've been here is the fact that that area is located right next to where we sort the books as they come in, which is kind of a noisy process. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to try to find a way to sort of sonically isolate the duplication stuff, because um, duplication now is a lot of post-production work as well, um, and that is best done in a quiet space. So um, that's something that we look into, and we'll see how we were able to address that in some slides coming up. Um, from there, um, we have a bunch of circulation shelves. Um, heading down hallway over to where the recording studios are located. 
and Gabe's kind of tracking down there. And then that area there is the recording studios that we had in the lower level. Um, they're still down there if anyone's looking for yeah. some of these studios. <laughs> uh, the, the bones of everything is still there. Um, those recording studios were built um, up on a ramp area, so they're sort of isolated from the floor of the basement. And then past that, we have more shelving. And that area actually goes a little bit under the sidewalk. It's a, that's a vaulted area that goes extends beyond the outside confines of the, uh, the what would that be the east wall of the building? Yeah, the end of the building is roughly right here. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of where we were, what we were starting with. Oh, uh, the meeting rooms and stuff too, I guess I forgot to mention. Yeah. Uh, the, the meeting rooms are all these things down toward the bottom here. We've got the, the storage area, uh, the heron room, and the crane room. And um, those are quite large spaces too, so we had to think about how we were using those. And that's yet another long range consideration issue. We had to um, think about how various different parts of the Library Commission were using those spaces um, as things transition gradually to more webinar based things too. Um, we oftentimes don't have meetings that end up using like the whole crane room, which is a fairly large space. Um, so we're able to get away with a somewhat smaller space that's um, thoughtfully designed, can still um, address a lot of those sorts of issues. So let's move on to the next slide here. This is um, a raw illustration of the space that we moved into. Uh, I guess there's a date up toward the top of there from uh, winter of 2013. Um, this was taken after we got access to go explore the new space a little bit more thoroughly and take a tape measure with us to get some real numbers on, on how this would work. Um, and you really do need to think about that. For a move like this, we were, weren't looking at doing a full teardown and rebuild. We were going to try to retain as much as possible of the currently existing spaces that are already in there, um, only removing what we absolutely had to remove. Um, so after taking all these measurements, it was mostly a matter of figuring out what walls definitely did need to come down and then what we could repurpose from there. Um, we ultimately didn't end up building any new spaces into the area other than the recording booths themselves. Um, which we'll address that in a moment. But for the most part, we were talking about spaces that would kind of have to be removed here. So like in this illustration, um, on the west side, there's a wall that had to come out right over there um, so that that area can be used for shelving more efficiently. And the wall um, was non-structural. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We didn't, yeah, we didn't remove any structural walls. <laughs> that, was, That's good. that was a good yes. consideration. Um, there's a really beautiful curved wall right in the center of the space, which unfortunately did have to go out. It was a really pretty feature, but a really bad use of space, um, especially when you have shelving coming in. It, it just wouldn't work. Um, also, there were ultimately three offices in the center. Only one of those we decided to retain, and we opened up the other two. Yeah, that one's still there, and then the ones just to the north of that are gone. Um, all the stuff on the south side of the space had to be removed. There again, it was kind of bittersweet. The very first office um, toward the uh, southeast corner yeah, is a really cool. beautiful space. It had uh, all glass and it looked really striking. Mm -hmm. But again, unfortunately, it was just in a really bad location for strategically where we needed to move things. Unfortunately, um, other things we were able to retain along the east wall, all of those offices are now in use by uh, circulation and studio staff. And the northernmost space there, yes, one. that one there, um, we're able to use for some storage. Um, we also were able to keep a training room. Uh, the the Fire Spring folks had a uh, server room, basically back right where where Is Gabe was mousing there. there. Uh, we would yes, that this one, one right there. Here, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, and then they had a small kitchen beyond that. Um, with that space, what we were able to do was just move a non-structural wall that's between those two spaces to open that up to create another training room there. Um, so at this point, I was kind of doing things um, more or less by hand because this was all still quite preliminary at this point. Um, and after taking all these measurements, we could do some more realistic calculations. So in the basement, we had um, almost 13,000 square feet. Um, the total square footage in this new area is almost 8,000 square feet. So we went down by about 5,000 square feet, um, pretty substantial. Yeah. Um, shelving, similarly, uh, we had about 1,700 linear feet of shelving in the basement. Um, once we calculated what we could accommodate in the new space, it worked out to be a little under 1,000 linear feet. That actually, as we were in the process of installing things, we were able to pick up a little bit more. I think we're a little over, maybe you had six double units to yeah. us. So. Yeah, so I we might a be a little a, over 1,000. Yeah, I think yeah. a little over 1,000 now. Um, so we continue to do some careful measurements, and so this illustration is a transitional design as part of the process. Um, at this point, I had taken the measurements, and there's a 
a color-coded narrative that kind of goes with this page, but I didn't include that because it's more just um, internal details of basically how to use the rooms and what to do with them. So uh, some of the things we just talked about, you can sort of see the red X's here, removing certain non-structural walls. Um, the color coding is basically in reference to various different parts of the process where we would locate people. Um, a few other things maybe noteworthy there. I'll drag this down here. Um, there are some doors leading to another space that we're not occupying that are down on the south side, both on the west and then again here on the east. Um, those needed to be sealed up, so there's some references to having those spaces sealed up. Uh, let's see, we had, um, yeah, in this case, mostly it's just issues of deciding kind of where different um, portions of our operations would be best located. Um, I don't know how well you can see these, but there's some subtle dotted lines kind of progressing west east throughout the whole space. Um, those are just sort of preliminary marks for where I thought shelving would be located. Um, the windows, there's some very large open windows on the west side of the whole space. Mm -hmm. And as we were planning, we were kind of deciding whether we wanted shelving to run north south or west east. Um, one of the reasons we went with west east is to allow a lot more natural light into the space. Um, the studio staff, having been in the basement for 20 years, <laughs> um, we're, yeah, we're having some sunlight vitamin deficiency. <laughs> um, we have full length windows oh, as, yeah, as for an old department store because that's what this was. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, that helped a lot, having some nice lighting um, brought into the space, which frankly just makes it easier to see the book sometimes too. It's very difficult to mount lighting to deal with circulation stacks because they're fairly close together and they're quite mm -hmm. tall. Um, so there are always little spots that are kind of difficult to see when you're pulling books in the morning um, or shelving books in the afternoon. And now the whole area is much more evenly lit. Um, so that ended up being really good. Another aspect of that, um, in this illustration, this area down along the south in the center of the space um, is destined to become a recording studio location. And the nice part about locating them here is we were able to um, keep them somewhat away from the circulation stacks. The most active stacks tend to be back toward the northern side, and they're also somewhat protected by the center office that still remains. And this also creates a nice situation where the meeting room is toward the north side of the area while the studios are on the south. So that if people are having a meeting mm -hmm. that gets a little uproarious or something, I guess, <laughs> they don't tend to get too crazy. But you know, if, mm -hmm. if, um, if there is some, some volume coming from this area, it won't interfere with the studio operations, which is great too. There's so also that back door back there too. If they uh -huh. really need to, people can come in. They aren't right. walking past the studios. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that helps a lot. That's right. I didn't. I've snuck in again. that way too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I should mention. Yeah, right. Where I've got the cursor here, uh, there is a door right here from the hallway, and this actually tracks very nicely back to where the mail is located too. If I follow the cursor here, the mail goes across the hallway here, mm -hmm. and then it's basically back over in this corner. So that ends up working out quite well for um, mail delivery stuff as well. Um, so yeah, at this point we've got kind of a loose idea of what we need to do, and then we need to start working with a designer that's going to be able to formally implement the plan. Um, we took our initial designs and ended up working with an architectural firm called Interspace here in town. Um, they kind of came up with a process that works more or less in three parts. Um, you have a detailed demolition plan, then a detailed construction plan, and then the third element, um, they at least help with some logistics, but then you, you need to uh, contact a mover to actually coordinate the, the final aspects of getting things relocated. Um, they help us develop a remodeling narrative that had uh, two primary illustrations that go with it. Uh, the first one being this demolition plan. Um, it's difficult to see at this resolution where the dotted lines are, but a lot of those spots that we were talking about removing are dotted lines in the illustration, which indicate that they are to be removed. Um, the, the narrative itself, um, as a text, mentions some additional things like um, removing, oh, I didn't mention this, there, there is a shower in this space right where I have the cursor now. Um, yeah, we decided right. that, yes, there. There we are. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, we decided we could take care of that um, before work at home. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we have the shower removed. We we'll, we'll have a really cool uh, repurposing of that area, too, since it already um, has access to plumbing fixtures. Mm. Um, so they're removing the shower. Um, they're also going to remove all of the uh, uh, carpets and um, some different types of cabinetry uh, throughout other areas of the space. Um, so all of those things. There's that really nice shelf that ran. Yeah, right here. that's right. Yeah. There were some other pretty things. Yeah. yeah. So we had the beautiful curved wall. 
we had the beautiful glass office, and yeah, as Gabe's saying, there was this beautiful built-in shelving mm -hmm. in kind of an L shape. Yeah. We um, had to make hard choices. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was really pretty, but yeah, it wasn't it wasn't gonna work. I believe it was re recycled, however. I think it's that's what I hear. Nice somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. So that that aspect was kind of interesting. Um, so then we move on to the construction plan. Um, so this is pretty close to what we ended up actually following ultimately. Um, in this case, you see um, just one office here in the middle instead of the three. These offices structurally remain the same. You see a major wall removed here, creating a larger training room space, which is pretty decent size. Mm -hmm. um, the circulation area has moved over here. Uh, there are restrooms over here, which of course are in the same place. The shower that was over here is now sort of a little kitchenette area. Uh, not really large enough for anyone to sit in, but um, you know, certainly enough room to to use a sink and some cabinets um, to make food. There's a microwave back there, that sort of thing. There is a refrigerator as well that's kind of back in a little corner over here. Um, so that's close access to the training room folks too. If they would need to have any goodies there for a training, then that's fairly close access for that area. Um, there was one wall going through the center of this office back here. Again, that being non-structural, we removed that to make a larger area. And this is where the duplication equipment and post-production equipment is now. Um, sort of uh, completely walled off with a door, so it is quite a bit more acoustically isolated than it was um, as just a wide open space in the lower level. Um, the shelving here, again, we can see is going east-west. And the studios are these six rooms down here now. Um, I'll talk in a moment about why there are six rather than the four from before. Um, this door remains open over here as an, an egress door for um, mostly just for fire exits, things like that. Um, the door that was over here is now sealed. The main entrance remains the same, and there's another door over here. Um, so this is the basic layout that we began to work with. Um, and then you start talking details, basically, all the different infrastructure systems, which, you know, it, you don't think about every day, like just how complicated that stuff is, but mm -hmm. we just have page after page and final architectural drawings um, specifying what to do for all, all these types of things. Um, so with data, as you're making a move like this, you can consider updating what types of data you're using. Um, we were considering updating to Cat5 or Cat6 cable. Um, we do, of course, still need to use landlines, so we had to verify that we had telephone wiring everywhere. Um, in our case, we did end up having to add quite a bit of uh, pretty much all new data wiring everywhere and several phone lines as well. Um, then we had um, electrical issues. Um, our uh, duplication area as well as the studios do use quite a bit of electricity, so we did need to make sure those were stable and that we had you know, ample outlets um, to access those areas. Um, heating and cooling needs were interesting. Um, obviously, you want the whole space to have consistent heating and cooling, but here again, this becomes a particularly tricky issue with recording studios because a lot of heating and cooling systems do create noise. Um, in normal day-to-day -day circumstances, one can tune out the noise fairly easily, but microphones don't have as much luck tuning it out. <laughs> so, um, so we need to figure out ways to have the heating and cooling still work and have ample airflow, but also be as silent as possible. Um, we'll look at that in some subsequent slides. Um, the intercom system, we have an intercom that is in the lower level so people can um, be paged back to offices or certain areas of anywhere in the commission, basically, as needed. Um, so we needed to figure out how to move that system upstairs. Um, some plumbing issues in, to consider for remodeling. In our case, it was mostly just a matter of putting in a sink in the area where we removed the shower. Um, fire alarms, again, were kind of interesting because we had to figure out what to do with the studios. Um, being relatively soundproof, uh, you can't hear as well inside them, so we had some special strobe lights installed on the inside of the studios, um, which do work quite well. They're actually pretty blinding, actually. I was yeah, surprised yeah. at just how bright they are. <laughs> um, and then finishes. Um, we had to get new paint and new carpet for the space. Um, we were given some samples to work with on that. Um, in the meeting room as well, we made sure to have some walls done with um, a very white colored paint that could be used um, for projecting things on the walls. Um, we ended up doing two of those, so we've got some flexibility with moving that room around if we need to lay it out differently, and sort of had all those things to implement. Um, so the actual move itself, they started basically with obviously the demo, um, and then followed that with doing, doing the paint and carpet before we started moving things in. Um, so moving on to the recording studios for a moment, um, studios do sort of become a project within a project because they have some kind of unusual structural considerations. Um, 
really nice acoustically sealed places. Um, I guess to describe in layperson's terms, you're basically trying to build a room within a room. You try to um, build a space that absorbs sound on the inside and then is also somewhat decoupled from its surroundings so that it doesn't take outside sounds in. Um, so structurally, there were some architectural considerations, um, both physically building them as well as where to locate them and how to decouple them from the surrounding area. Um, then in terms of technical stuff, uh, digital recording, which we've been doing for, well, the whole last decade since I've been here. Um, as we've been here, that means that we've been doing a lot more post-production, um, reviewing of things. Now that we're doing the digital books, there's a level of doing navigation markup that patrons can use to skip around within various different elements of a book or magazine. And I thought that we really need some kind of new workspaces to do that stuff because th there's much, much more work being focused in those areas as time goes on. Um, and to try to do it in the open air is really, it's kind of difficult. So it's nice to have some spaces where you can actually hear what you're doing and, and really focus on it. Um, and again, over time, I think, you know, because digital recording makes everything, you know, quite asynchronous in terms of the production process, um, being able to take those things out of the studio into a place where you can sort of focus on um, quality and quantity issues is, is really nice to be able to do. Um, so in our case, we looked at what it would cost to have an architect come in and physically build something um, to have it designed and a contractor to build it. And we also looked at a variety of different companies offering modular booth designs. Um, our spaces are larger than the typical recording booth that you would see, which is sort of a phone booth size object, but of course they can build them to whatever size specifications you need. Um, that ended up looking like probably our best bet uh, for balancing uh, quality, getting to the types of noise reduction levels we were hoping for, um, balanced with cost, because you can easily run into you know, high six figures, like having something designed and built just for you, um, which um, as part of this move uh, wasn't really something we could, could do. It wasn't feasible. Yeah. And I don't know that the move really would have happened if we wanted to build like something really intensely expensive. <laughs> so, um, but we were able to uh, make that work. Um, my preliminary design for the recording studios in the six spaces is here, um, showing six rooms. Um, Four of them are still going to be used as um, studio as two studios. Um, you have a, a narrator room and a producer room for um, in pairs for each of those. In this particular illustration, um, this area here is a pair and this area here is a pair. Um, that box in the center indicating where windows would be um, to communicate between those rooms, and then these two would be standalone. Um, once we actually got into the space, um, you can see that the final layout is a little bit different here. Um, we end up having um, pairs of rooms that are on the outside here and the outside here with the standalone rooms in the center. Uh, largely this was done because this is a giant structural pillar right here as well as um, on either side of the area and you really can't do much to get around that. Um, so we ended up sort of changing the way we did that. Um, in this move also, um, the move was done as essentially an in-kind process with the owners of our building and so adding those two additional rooms um, we tried to negotiate those in um, to no avail. So we ended up having to go through a bidding process to um, pay for these middle two rooms. Well, not really to pay for them, but to have them built um, because of the dollar figure that had to go through the, the state bidding process to uh, verify that, um, that they were obtained correctly. So um, we found a company to work with um, for the, our building owners um, to install their four rooms. So we recommended in our bidding process that we go with a company that could provide the same brand so that everything would be the same. Because again, you wouldn't really want to have um, two different companies' products in the same location if you didn't have to all install at the same time. Because one of my big goals was just trying to make all these rooms sound exactly the same. So as you go from room to room, everything is completely translatable. Um, so when we're talking about different sound issues in the studios, we're all on the same page no matter where we're sitting. Um, so that helps quite a bit. Um, so the actual demolition um, went through a good chunk of 2014. Um, they, they went all the way down to uh, removing some tile that was underneath the carpet and um, getting the whole floor re-leveled and ready to go. Um, they removed the walls that we requested, um, including the set of offices where the recording booths went. Um, they got the shower out of there and got the wall out of the old um, server room kitchen thing to make a better uh, training room area. And then the recording booths arrive here. We've got a few photos of, of the construction there. They were truly a, an astonishing amount of equipment. That entire trailer is completely full. Um, the the lading bill that day just blew my mind. I mean, it weighed, the, the weight of those studios was like more than a car. 
Um, we knew that the truck was coming. We were, is it here yet? Is it here yet? And then they, 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 well, there it is. <laughs> but you remember that ice storm we had a week before Thanksgiving last fall? Yes. Guess what? <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. Exactly. yeah. We looked out that it wasn't slick that day, but yeah, yeah. it, it yeah. could have been pretty scary. So um, with this company, uh, the Vocal Booth, um, the company we went with is called VocalBooth.com. Um, the vocalbooth.com people send a uh, technician now to oversee the building of, of the booths, and then they hire local people to actually do the construction work. Um, so the, uh, the area that's prepared for them now, you can see the HVAC stuff sticking out of the ceiling. Um, there are also outlets, which you can't really see there, but these things are essentially standalone, and you, you run wiring to the booth and then wire the booth um, from outside wiring. Um, so that, that's an area where three booths are going to go. There's uh, basically two banks like that. Um, and here's some of the work in progress. They're laying down the, the floors. Um, kind of a note here, which I thought might be interesting for people who aren't familiar with this stuff, this is sort of what the inside of a wall looks like. So you can see um, what happens to stop sound transmission is it'll, it'll hit these outside walls, and then little pockets of air, like over here, over here, over here, are really what help to stop sound transmission. Sound hits things, um, is somewhat absorbed and somewhat reflected as it hits a solid object, and then some of it passes through the air, hitting another object and then hitting another object. And each time you hit those air pocket solid object transitions is where you really start to absorb a lot of sound. Um, different types of materials uh, absorb different frequency ranges better as well. So that's why you see a, a mixture of materials. Um, so basically they get them laid out on the floor. Um, they get the doors installed. Uh, the trickiest part ultimately is um, connecting them to those HVAC systems up above. Um, just as that's wrapping up, um, we had movers. I'm here in, in the Lincoln and Omaha area. Von Rensel is a fairly well-known library mover. Uh, they came in to uh, coordinate moving all of our book materials and office materials from the lower level to the first level. Um, in this particular shot, um, I think the studios were just being wrapped up when they started moving the actual uh, physical shelving upstairs. Um, and then they uh, code the books very carefully so they can get everything relocated on the proper shelves upstairs. Um, which they did a wonderful job of. We really didn't have any problems at all. Great job. Yeah, that aspect went quite well. Um, we do have some new studio technology. Um, because we were moving upstairs and we hadn't updated the computers in the basement for, I think, six or seven years, um, the materials that we were using to record in the basement were basically completely out of date. Um, we were using an audio interface that requires going through a serial port, which a lot of newer computers don't even have. Um, most things have moved toward uh, USB power at this point, um, or you know, lightning bolt or firewire, that sort of thing. In our case, we went with a USB audio interface on um, the lower right here. This is a Audient product called the ID22, and uh, we tried several different things. I, I had uh, some companies send out sample things to test. Um, ultimately, this thing worked the best for our types of needs, both in terms of inputs for recording and the ability to route sound back out um, into the the uh, narrator's room so they can hear what's going on as well. Um, similarly, we'd been using kind of a hodgepodge of uh, fairly low-end speakers to do recording, and I wanted us to have, um, these aren't exactly the world's fanciest speakers, but they're, they're pretty solid and they're quite consistent. Um, these are a, a JBL product, and um, there are, are uh, copies of, or pairs of these in both the studios as well as the multi-purpose rooms where we're doing post-production and editing and reviewing. And there's also a pair of them over in the duplication area um, for the post-production that happens over there as well. So again, if we're ever talking about, um, say, a particular narrator has a, a sibilance issue, like a, a high-pitched um, upper-mid S sound that's coming through too loudly, um, when we're discussing that, we know we're all hearing the same thing because it's coming through the same sorts of speakers. Um, whereas in the past, some people's speakers would like really you know, bump those upper-mids, whereas others would have them fairly controlled and we'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Everything sounds fine. Yeah. So uh, this way we've got a pretty clear indication without having to go in and do like, you know, frequency analysis moment to moment, which I do a lot of that anyway, just sort of looking at files for, for trends or certain things that we could work with. Um, but it, it gives us a little bit of help with that. Um, we stuck with the, the microphones that we were using were fine. Um, we retained basically as much equipment as possible. Um, I definitely didn't just want to buy new things just for the sake of buying new things, but with the audio interfaces, that was pretty important because we really were... We needed it. Yeah, it was yeah. down to the point where it was almost impossible to make any changes whatsoever to the system. Yeah. Um, so this should buy us some flexibility for a few years. Um, th these things, you know, 
they're essentially computers nowadays, and so unlike you know real to real machines where you could maybe use the same machine for 20, 30 years and just relap the heads every once in a while, these things you know are somewhat um, made to be replaced every few years. So <clears throat> that's the world we live in. So. Um, and it sounds good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's that. Um, so here's a quick tour of what the space itself looks like. Um, the, uh, in this photo, we're seeing on the right side the uh, Library Commission front doors, um, which are the main doors that have been there since 94. Um, the next slide here is essentially just going to look over to the west from here. Um, this is the other side of the escalators. And it's hard to photograph out here because there is so much light coming in from, from this uh, central area of our building. Um, but this area is the new area. Um, here you can see those front doors a little bit better here. And so I'll do a really quick tour of this stuff and then we can sort of talk about the studio experience itself. Um, when volunteers come in the front door to do narration, they can stop at this desk and check in. Um, they tell us uh, what project they're working on and how long they're working on it. And um, folks that are working on books uh, have books sort of in this little cubicle system here that they can check with. Uh, and in case we can't find a word on the internet, uh, there's this nice old unabridged dictionary over here That's that funny. sometimes comes in handy. Um, looking up various anfractuosities. <laughs> so, um, yep, went the wrong way there. Okay, so um, the studios here are on the left and you can see some of the circulation stacks. Um, from the illustration we saw earlier, uh, this stack right here was able to come out quite a bit closer to the studios than we had guessed. Um, so we did gain some linear feet of shelving there that would, will definitely come in handy. Um, the offices that were in that space um, on the east wall do remain there and we were able to use those quite nicely. Um, the mail processing area, uh, is this is essentially where a couple of those offices in the center of the space were removed um, to kind of make room for this giant circulation table that runs north-south. And then the uh, outgoing mail is sorted into these bags over here, the circulation table being back here. Um, the new training room is called the Cardinal Room, and this is a scene, a shot from the, the front door looking um, to the north. Uh, in this area, um, basically we had to remove a wall that was, some, I guess, somewhere over in this area. Um, separating two rooms in the original space. And um, it's, it's worked out pretty well so far. I think it's a nice space. We did get some uh, new, some new uh, countertops and then some new fronts to cabinets that were sort of old and worn out. Um, uh, I think a new sink fixture, uh, things like that in this space. And we got some new tables. Um, again, like with, with thoughtful design, it made more sense to order some different size tables that would um, orient better in this space. Um, and these tables are also wired so that people can plug their laptops directly in, which is a really nice feature as well. Yeah, that room is nice. That's as needed. That's what, if anyone's been here and done training, we had the Heron room downstairs from here, which had, I think it was 12 desktops permanently set up in there. Right. Now we have this room that we can either have it be that way, where it's just for having meetings, or we bring in a bank of laptops, plug right. it in, and boom, you have your computer lab. Yeah, I saw the computer team even has that nice, there's a, a rack now to bring the computers They got something down. new, yeah, to just bring really them all cool. over. Yeah, I haven't had to well, do mobile. it. Yeah, yeah, to make yeah. it all mobile, yeah. Yeah, it was very efficient. It looks really neat. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some nice uh, cardinal uh, illustrations around the building, too. So now we've got a Decorate few of them. Decorate these birds, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we've got some, I don't know what's going on with these cardinals over here. They look a little jaundiced, but uh, <laughs> I guess I'm not sure what state that is. But we've got some nice red ones there and some sort of yellowish um, uh, nutritionally deficient ones over there. And uh, okay, so the duplication area, um, again, having switched from cassette duplication, we do very, very little of that at this point, basically just to repair books very infrequently. Um, primarily, uh, this is focused now on digital duplication. Um, this very unusual looking computer on the right, I figured I would do a, a close up of this so folks could see it a little bit better. Um, this is a, com a computer that has a special fixture attached to it to accommodate the shape of our cartridges being plugged into it. Uh, this runs on a Linux piece of software called Gutenberg, uh, which is uh, made by NLS um, for us to use. There are some really weird problems with trying to do duplication of tons and tons of USB devices on Windows-based computers. Um, basically, Windows operates under the notion that when you plug something into it that's a USB device, that you're going to have a fairly limited number of those on a computer. Um, maybe a, um, a camera, a scanner, an iPod. Um, yeah, probably less than 20 things in the course of owning a computer. So when you end up plugging 100,000 USB devices into them, it's writing stuff to the Windows registry for each one of them that ultimately completely consumes the computer <laughs> and destroys it. Kills it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's impossible to clean out. We, we've tried to clean the registry, but it's basically impossible. So we've, we've switched to using this uh, Linux-based system, which works quite well. Um, we have that system as well as a, a similar device that works as a backup. Um, so the cartridge duplication happens there, and there's a desk um, in this photo on the left um, toward the right side of that photo, uh, where some post-production happens, and um, 
Again, that sort of matches the setup that one finds in the studio sonically. Um, the little shower area is now this uh, kitchenette. Um, that tile left over is like bathroom tile, I guess, from the yeah. shower area. It works so, nice for you. Yeah, yeah the, the shower was sitting fine. exactly where that's basically right where the counter is. starts. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's for our volunteers and, and staff to use. Right. And and, and visitors. Yeah, for volunteer areas, yeah, we keep lemon juice and honey and that sort of thing around. Um, the narrator booths uh, basically look like this, um, with a chair and a microphone and some lighting options. Um, producer booths look like this, again, with some yeah. different lighting options, the speakers, a talkback microphone, and the software we're using. Uh, the review and markup rooms look pretty similar. Uh, they do have microphones here for doing things like assembly, or we may need to record um, some transitional materials to um, that have to do with navigation of books. Um, the uh, finished studios themselves, um, you can see uh, the HVAC stuff has been connected here and now has fancy insulation around it. Um, we, it's, it's so tricky making those things be quiet. Um, initially when they installed them, they just left tin on them, and the tin mm -hmm. somewhat acts as a megaphone bringing in resonant sounds from throughout the room and yeah. conveniently tossing them directly into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so we ran the studios in the basement for a while while we got this worked out. Um, but this insulation is working quite well, and now they're, they're quite silent. And this is what's left of the basement area. Um, it is. It is empty. It is yeah. empty. Yeah. Yep. It's pretty amazing. This was just emptied out uh, literally last week. So um, the the process it, it's taken a while to complete the move. It sort of happened in phases. Um, we moved the uh, the studios were physically built upstairs around November, and we moved circulation stuff upstairs around November. But we didn't end up recording upstairs until about February or so because we were waiting um, on having some type of issues solved with yeah. the studios. Yeah. We have decades of memories in those walls. Yeah. Right, very much so. I think that's, oh yes, one more little thing. Um, Our beautiful windows. Yes. Yeah, not yeah, having had windows, windows before, it gives us a little opportunity to do promotion. So mm -hmm. um, you can see these posters here. Um, we have a lot of foot traffic past our location, oh, and yeah. so now we can leave some, some posters out sort of explaining what we do. And um, I can see people looking at those and stopping to read them really often as they go past the space. So I, I hope they're having some impact. Certainly they're being read. Mm -hmm. So that's helped quite a bit. Um, but yeah, at this point, I think we should talk a bit about um, what the studios are like and kind of the volunteer experience. I'll maybe go back to a photo of uh, Brad's. There it is. There's, uh, There's you Brad Heron's hanging out there. Yeah, spend all your time. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of time there, yes. Yeah. Well, since you, you were here before and after the move, if you just want to quick like compare and contrast, ah, uh, sure. As far, as far as the sound, lighting, um, oh, the general likes and dislikes. <laughs> oh, I, I, I really like the new boots. Um, I think uh, you know one of the things that would every once in a while kind of creep into the old uh, uh, studios downstairs um, when they were built on the ramp. If you had another narrator coming in after your session, if your session was at, you know, from 2.30 to 4.30 and the other narrator's session was from 3 to 5, right. you could every once in a while hear the footsteps mm -hmm. down the hallway right. through the uh, the old studios. We had to stop yep. and then wait and then go back. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't I, – I, I can't hear a thing uh, yep. when I'm in those uh, booths. The only thing I hear is, is – uh, Gabe's voice telling me to be louder or be softer or stop <laughs> or you missed a word here or there. Um, they're very silent. Um, I, I, and I haven't heard any air it sounds like the HVAC sounds. Uh, I haven't heard any of them. You know, I, we've been, I've been using these boosts since we started, yeah. uh, you know, since they were constructed. Um, lighting is great. You know, um, uh, it's dark inside the room except for the light. So it, it really, uh, you know, illuminates the material pretty well. Um, the the speakers are great. Uh, the sound levels, you know, it's not too soft on the talk back into my area uh, and vice versa. No, they, they're great. Uh, I've really been pleased with them. Temperature has been nice, too. We, yeah, we, we had, had a big yeah, issue with that. That yeah. was also a, a problem, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the basement ones, and again, that kind of had to do with the soundproofing issues. During um, the summer, they became a hot box. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> typically around 10 and sometimes even 15 degrees hotter than the surrounding area. Um, now we've got some zone control, so we can control the temperature within the studio area separate from the rest of the space, uh, which seems to be working quite well. Um, they have uh, two thermostats, one on each end of that whole bank of rooms, and I go in and check on those every once in a while, and typically they're within a couple degrees of the outside area. Yeah, I which, think the general consensus from our volunteers is 
you know, on a one to one hundred scale, they ninety five percent love them. Um, the the only complaint I have has to do with lighting and just the general construction of them of them in general. Some people, it's not quite enough light in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the way they're constructed is it's actually you know separate boxes. Right. You've got two separate windows, so you get a really bad glare every once in a while. Yeah, that's true. Where yeah. downstairs they shared a window essentially, yep. and they shared a wall. Right. Wow. Yeah, I think the window was at a. I think the window downstairs yeah. was at a like, at angle. An angle. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's one. Although sound transmission between the rooms always bothered me in the basement. Yes. Yeah, especially if we had male narrators yeah. with a really rich low voice, yeah. um, you would hear because narrator rooms were back to back with one another. You could hear that. You could yeah, totally you hear. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you could even in the even in the narrator booths. Uh, uh, the narrator section of the, the booth, uh, mm -hmm. you could hear the other narrator two doors down. Sometimes right. I, mean, I could I could hear them in the old. Uh, yeah, you know, and I don't. And like I said, I don't hear I don't hear a thing, except for Gabe's voice uh, okay. in 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 the the room. I guess maybe you know I really like the booths. Uh, uh, I have I have not experienced any problems with glare or any of that. I'm I'm not saying that I'm special, but I I haven't noticed them. Um, <laughs> I guess I guess they are. If you were a person that was a little claustrophobic, maybe, or maybe a little had a little anxiety about being enclosed in a very small, or not very small, but in a smaller contained area, maybe. But I don't think that they're too small. Are these smaller um, than the ones that were downstairs? Then they're pretty. Cool. They're roughly the same. Yeah, they're the same roughly size. the same. Yeah. But I think That's the darker wall, the dark walls, yeah. and oh, the door okay. that closes behind you there uh, right. gives it a, a sense of a smaller enclosure. But I, it's big enough for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And yeah I, 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 I don't, I don't have a problem with them. I think the the, the outsides were eight eight by ten, so mm -hmm. the in, inside would be somewhat smaller, maybe half. Smaller. Yeah, if I remember right, they're within a couple inches, length and widthwise the same. Uh, the yeah. ceiling height is slightly uh, shorter by I think five, between five and six inches. Yeah, right? that's that's about right. Yeah, so they're roughly the same size. They're, they're it's just the, the darker colors make it feel smaller. That's true. Yeah. That's yeah. true. And yeah. the fabric, so that dark fabric might. Yeah. Be yeah. yeah. And that fabric does a good job of catching reflected sound yeah. too. I've been really happy with that. Um, in in the basement, we did have some problems with reflected sound creating sort of delays. Mm -hmm. Um, especially again with louder narrators, yeah. voices would sort of bounce around the room a little bit, and these really do catch sound and not let it bounce around. We have no issues with sound quality anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's helped a lot. That, yeah, that, it's been a major improvement. I've, I'm, I, I, as a narrator, have been really happy with all the improvements. I, I think these are booths are great. Yeah. yeah, and we've had narrators and and well, staff who've had some problems with the mobility issue, and from here it's a front door and oh, yeah. a few steps in your ear. Yeah. Instead of going all the way downstairs, and yeah, so they then, are ADA accessible. We have ADA the uh, we have a way to put a wheelchair ramp to right. them if, if that's a need. Right. We yeah, purchase right. the ramp, and it's there to install as needed. Yeah. I mean, it's just right there. So they do have custom doors as well for that reason. Uh, that are ADA width. Uh, I think the standard one, doors are a little right. bit more narrow. Um, but yeah, with these you can easily get a wheelchair in and out. And um, yeah, like Gabe said, we have a wheelchair ramp that's um, very quick to install. Yeah. We can put it up in a minute to have people get in. So that's been quite helpful too. Um, so yeah, these do have the same sort of room within a room construction, but they have it within themselves basically. So they're sort of built as like a, an outer box and then built around that. So with, well, with that, that interconnects running. That's between. something ADA accessibility that you didn't touch on earlier. You know, shelves have to be spaced so far apart. That's right. Like that. Yeah, there's measurements throughout the whole area. Um, we verified that the, for instance, the restrooms were going to be ADA accessible. Mm -hmm. um, that as shelves were laid out, um, we kind of sort of designed what that would look like on the floor to make sure it stayed ADA compliant everywhere. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a pretty accessible space. Um, obviously, much more so than you know any circumstances getting into a basement where you right. have to rely on elevators, which right. sometimes are down. Yeah. So, and it's amazing how you know the the booths are located. I mean, right in right towards the front of the of the of the space, and right in the middle of the you know uh, where people are walking in or signing in or 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 you know in their office or walking around and you I I can't hear a peep when the when that door is shut it's it's being like in your own little world there's there's no outside sounds that come in and I can see people you know through the through the door of uh, the window on the door walking you know walking by or talking to people and and I can't hear a thing 
They're great. Excellent. And yeah, you've really gotten to see all the technology we've used over like the last 12 years or so. Oh, yeah. Um, going from reel to reel, which you know the reel to reel machines themselves generated a lot of noise. Yes, they did. Click, click, mm -hmm. click. No, actually, the keyboard clang, clang. I mean, they were very loud. <laughs> yeah. They had machine noises. Yes, yep. they did. Yeah, and then you had to back. If you had to back up to 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 redo a sentence, you had to back up like to a, a sentence and a half before, and then play it and again catch it at the right, right spot. It's called a rolling edit. Exactly, mm -hmm. and, and uh, we don't have, we have, and that takes up some time. It does. I mean, little increments here and there add up after. A while, uh, but no, the switch to the more the, the digital yeah. uh, interface uh, and recording was was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the editing we do now we can do um, without having to use volunteer time. Um, we right. can just drop markers in the recordings as we go, and then clean things up a little bit in terms of spacing right after someone leaves. Uh, I find that extremely helpful. And well, that was a, you know an issue when we were downstairs. We were using not only old computers older software, but they weren't networked either. That's right. And now we can sit at our desks, pull something from the studios if we need to work on it. We don't actually have to be physically be in the studios even. Right. Um, we've got newer computers, uh, newer software, um, and it sped things up. Right. So That's, you know, something we didn't mention is there is a very small server room in the new space. Yeah. Um, because we're quite a physical distance away from where the main servers are in the library commission now, mm -hmm. We had to do some pretty interesting uh, tricks to get the wiring to get over to the new space. Mm -hmm. um, Vern um, from our uh, computer department did some amazing work yes. to get those over there, but that's been super helpful. He's done a lot of climbing on ladders. Yeah, I saw it last year for it's that. It's the high yeah. ceiling in the building's main entrance. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 In fact, we've gained roughly 30 minutes per project that we've worked on since the move. Um, so projects are taking about 30 minutes less, which doesn't seem like a lot until you add that up over... For each project, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. a lot of projects, yeah. yeah well, we about moving book carts from one wing to the other much right. easier than between floors. Mm -hmm. right. And book carts travel all, all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, all those little things, you know, even if you only save a second or two here and there, mm -hmm. you know, I try not to exactly micromanage things, but at the same time, like, gosh, when you do save five or ten seconds on, on a given process in studio that you end up doing a hundred times every day and, you know, thousands and thousands of times every year, it, it's a huge um, savings in terms of productivity. You can add another book project potentially, get another magazine done. And those things are really significant, you know, and pay off for the patrons. Too, so. And I think another example of that is uh, the, the computers in the, 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 the uh, where the recorders are sitting, where Gabe's sitting, Right. Are wired to the internet. So if there's a word that we can't pronounce and uh, and it's not in the dictionary and in the myriad of dictionaries that sit next to the narrator, right. we can just call it up and you can get a you can get a definition and a pronunciation off the web right. like that. I remember when we first when I first started working or, or volunteering here, especially with the with the real to real, you know, Dave would have to get up. You got to go out of the room, go down to the, the computer, you know, look it up, and it would take. Anywhere from two minutes to ten minutes just right. to try to find a word, and, yeah. you know, and, and having them wired there right on the spot. I can pull it up in thirty yeah. seconds. Well, there, we, had, we had a we had an incident just like that last week at, or two weeks ago where it was there was a, a, a food pronunciation or a, or a talent or something, and it wasn't in the dictionary. And uh, Gabe was just like, oh. Push play and it gave a pronunciation. I was like, all right, let's go. Yeah, YouTube ends up being really helpful for us a lot of times, like with um, young kids' uh, sports names, for instance, that maybe are just joining the Huskers. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes, oh, yeah. we can find yeah. like some some pre-roll footage of, of their high school careers where someone says their name correctly, and yeah, so yeah. things like that that are very yeah. difficult to track down. Um, YouTube can be really helpful for us. And, or, make, and it makes a difference. People mm -hmm. want to have their names said correctly. Sure. As a person that gets their name uh, mispronounced all the time, it's very. Yeah. And once you hear that mispronunciation a hundred times in that article, it gets old after a while. So right. it is nice to have that function. Right. Right. I don't know if there's any questions. Um, not right now. Um, does anybody have any questions out there? If you do, uh, type into your uh, questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. We can answer any questions you might have. Um, or tell me you have a microphone and I can unmute you. Um, but nobody asked during while you were, while you were talking, no. Okay. Um, I think you were pretty comp comprehensive about how you did everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know I can't think of anything that I was wondering about. Okay. 
I don't see anything coming in. And it was mm -hmm. it's uh, it was very uh, nice to uh, you know because Scott's talking about the water seepage into the basement yeah. of the old place, while it prevents some on Scott's level some technical problems. And on the narrator side, it was nice to be able to not have to smell must. <laughs> You know, a musty <laughs> basement, or to have, or when it did have those leakages, they had to have fans running to to try the yeah, car, which right. of course is the Great ambient sound. noise yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So it, it's just been really, really nice to have the move up to the first floor. Uh, from a narrator perspective, it's been really nice. We don't have any more errant sounds. There's no nasty odors that linger for a week. Uh, it's not a it's not a hot box in the in the, in the summertime. Uh, I suppose about that. You think down in a basement, usually it's supposed to be cooler, but right. obviously, well, many issues that were yeah, going on down right. there that you well, wouldn't expect. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Environmental. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. This area seems a lot easier to yeah. to keep running, mm -hmm. basically. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Some of these, you know, it's it's funny, like with these old buildings. You know, I, I have an old house myself too, and mm -hmm. it's difficult. There's certain weird, quirky things that happen mm -hmm. that are you know, just really difficult to get them under control, and you know, in a building of this size and scope. Those areas can be fairly large and just again very hard to. Hard and to like dissolve. you said, Dave, this used to be a department store, so it was yeah, originally it built for a totally yeah. different purpose than all these little individual offices that we have here, right. which is why very much in the winter time sometimes we have fans running in our offices because right. it's gotten too hot, or in the summertime you have a heater going because it's gotten too cold, mm -hmm. just because it just wasn't originally built for right. mm -hmm. chopping it up like we did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this building has had a number of lives as, well, yes. as, as a department store prior to World War One, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or maybe just shortly after 1919. Yeah, it was about 1919. Okay, shortly after. Yeah, the Rudge mm -hmm. and Gunzel Company um, started the building. Um, wow. Those of us who are uh, Nebraska Talking Book patrons may have actually heard us record an article about the building. Yes, right. Right. Ah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Nebraska that. history did <laughs> not want to Strange building. feeling. Like, wow. <laughs> <is us>. <laughs> yeah, it was, Nebraska history is such an interesting magazine to read, too, because as we recorded that, we discovered that there were more elevators than we knew about at the time, right. too. And I went looking oh, for them really? after we recorded yeah, There's some empty elevator yeah. shafts in this building. Sure <laughs> enough, there were <laughs> yeah, yeah. some <laughs> It was amazing. Maybe that's where those errant sounds nice. are coming from. Well, ghosts. Yeah. Uh -huh. ghosts. No stories about ghosts, though? No. Yet? No? All right. No, I just never did have any ghosts. That's, no. that's a, kind of a letdown. <laughs> no. Nothing I saw. You have a bus of Willa Cathy, though, when she came up with us. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. She's she the bus. Oh, right. Yes. All right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody has any urgent questions. Nobody typed anything in while we were chatting, so I guess we'll assume you guys are all good. You don't have anything. <laughs> any last uh, yeah, Any last, last words? words? Um, I guess if anyone does have any questions about moving stuff or you're looking at doing some kind of move, um, feel free to um, give us a, a call at the Talking Book and Braille service. And um, while it's still fresh in our minds, we can definitely <laughs> help out. Um, it was it was a very interesting learning process. I know for, for me, mm -hmm. um, at the time, I, I sort of became kind of the point person for uh, speaking with a bunch of different um, people that we had to speak with to, to coordinate all of this. And it was a, a great learning experience, and uh, I learned a lot more about Buildings and uh, contracts and bidding and um, inf building infrastructure and um, good things to know though because you never know when they're going to come in handy. You know, I mean, library work occasionally does have uh, construction work mixed in. Twenty years from now, when you got to move again. I suppose. <laughs> yeah, these right. things happen. At times, felt like this was a long dark tunnel, but the tunnel ends someplace worthwhile <laughs> if that encourages somebody. Yeah. And, and from the and on the narrator side. The, the, it's been a, a, a major improvement. Excellent. You know, we've been uh, from, speaking from myself. I've been really pleased with the outcome. The booths are better. The sound, I think the outcome and the product is better. And the and the overall narrator experience has been improved so significantly since uh, we made the move up here. So awesome. thank you. It was been it's been a pleasure. <laughs> well, Brad, thank you. Yeah, yeah. more than welcome. Yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to do it. We, we want you to have a nice, comfortable room while you're here. <laughs> you know, you're doing well, what you're doing. mission accomplished. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Cool. Oh, and um, if anyone is wondering, too, um, uh, Scott, you did mention those pictures on the slides. It may have been difficult to see when you're watching now. Right. Um, the slides will be included and posted with the recording later. Oh, great. Perfect. So um, I'll put them up so you'll be able to download them and get a, you know, or look at them on your screen and, you know, get That's a better great. look at the way all that kind of mapping out of everything Sounds great. went. So that'll be included as well. 
um, make it easier for you. So I think that will wrap it up. You can pass me the mouse here oh, so yes. I can move things along. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you very much, Brad, Gabe, Scott, and Dave, for being here today and telling us everything you wanted to know about moving our uh, talking book and braille service from the basement to the West Wing. And we dubbed it the West Wing, right? That right. Was it's over called there. originally. Yeah. That was, uh, <laughs> West Wing. Someone came up with that idea. Yeah, I'm not sure who it was, but yeah. It was, I remember back when we were first talking about it, some email last year mentioned that, and I was like, really? Cool. All right. <laughs> we can go with that. So that will wrap it up for this, this week's show. Um, it has is being recorded and will be posted to our um, Encompass Live website, which is here. And our recordings are right here underneath our um, upcoming episodes. All of our archives are here. As I said, all of our previous shows, um, the, the recording goes onto YouTube. The slides will go up onto our SlideShare account. Um, and if there are any links related to a show, um, we'll put them into our Delicious account and link them here as well. Um, I'll add a link just to the TBBS uh, main webpage okay. for more information about what you guys do to the recording for this one then. Um, so that'll be up yeah, later this afternoon, depending on how long it takes me to get everything done. Um, so that'll wrap it up for today. I hope you join us next week when our topic is Library Challenge, the amazing library race. Um, this is the, the Kearney Public Schools um, did a, have come up with a new way to teach their kids how to use the library, trying to make it more interactive, more fun. They do an actual competition, like the Amazing Race type thing, where the kids have to look at, you know, answer research questions and whatnot. And we're going to have some staff there, Connie um, Jelkin and Kelly Melson from Kearney Public Schools are going to be with us and tell us all about um, this new program they got going out at the schools there. Um, so do sign up for that and any of our other shows you can see here on our list of upcoming episodes. Also, if you are a Facebook user, Encompass Live is also on Facebook, so do go ahead and <coughs> excuse me, like us over on Facebook. I post reminders, um, as you can see here, reminder of when a new show is starting up, um, posts about our recordings when they're available, reminders about next week's show coming up. So if you are a big user of Facebook and want to keep up with what we're doing, that's where we do most of our uh, social pro, uh, promotion. So other than that, that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>